Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Ayana Ballroom for the next session of East Venture Summit 2022. I hope you enjoyed your short break. Hopefully, you've had some caffeine intake with the boots from 4 and morning outside as we are now ready to proceed to the next agenda. We're going to have our first panel discussion of the day. The topic is Thriving in Uncertainty. Founders' Perspectives of Recent Economic Events. So you can get all of the best insights from this panel discussion. We kindly ask you to please take your seats before I invite the moderator and the speakers of this session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now, we're going to continue the next session to our panel discussion. Again, the topic is Thriving in Uncertainty, Founders' Perspectives of Recent Economic Events. I would like to first invite our moderator, Pascal Christian Sarana, VP Investment of East Ventures, and also our speakers, Andre Susanto, co-founder and CEO of We Are Six, Andre Ku, co-founder and group CEO of Moladin, and Sigit Kuagam, co-founder and CEO of Bibith. <music> Morning, everyone. Um, morning to Andre, Andrew, and Sigit. Thank you very much for being with us today, this morning. So maybe to kickstart off, give a quick introduction on, 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 on yourself and what you're doing. Then we can, we can move on for an interesting discussion of the day. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, well, it's a bit cold here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Andre. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Wear6. So a bit about the company, um, Wear6 is a logistic integrator. We are operating in Indonesia. Um, so Wear6, we focus on business strategy first, and then we develop the tech. So we develop this operating system um, to orchestrate the most efficient supply chain process. And then what we attack, we attack the 10 to 15% broker margin in Indonesia, and we attack the unproductive assets. Uh, our value propositions to the customers and vendors are very clear. To the customers, we provide uh, a great fulfillment and um, a quality of data. And to the vendors like transporter and warehousing company, which is very fragmented in Indonesia, we focus on increasing their uh, asset utilization. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew, and uh, I'm from Moladin, the co-founder and CEO. So at Moladin, we are building an auto ecosystem within uh, both as a marketplace and also as a financing platform. Essentially, we use and we build tools with our agents as well as some of the managers. We work with uh, the entire part of the value chain in the ecosystem, including financing companies, including dealers, new car dealers, used car dealers. And essentially, we hope to empower all of them. And currently, we have about 75,000 uh, agents onto our platform, and the company is about 6,000 employees. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess very nice to see you all in person again, like after many, many years. My name is Sigit. Um, um, I'm from Bibit. Uh, we, we are a digital wealth management company and helping Indonesian invest primarily in the capital market. I think um, what we are trying to solve, I guess, is it has been like very, very difficult for majority of Indonesians to accumulate uh, wealth. And maybe as a numbers, um, as a context, actually, the, the average wealth per adult in Indonesia is about 11,000 US dollars. Um, but the median wealth is only $2,000. So 50% um, uh, or more of the people actually have less than a um, MacBook Pro in, under their name, right, as their net worth. And um, Indonesia is actually um, probably the only G20 country in the world that has faster GDP growth than the wealth growth per capita. So means that I think it's, it has been um, very, very... Uh, there is a lot of like um, discrepancy in like uh, wealth, and and there is a lot of um, a big gap. So I think um, the idea is that uh, if we can help people to participate in the capital market and in the growth of the economy, 
I think that can um, solve um, a lot of issues um, with the uh, uh, general like um, living quality uh, for Indonesians. I think the idea is like to help them um, invest uh, for the future. Um, majority of Indonesians still don't have the idea of like um, managing their wealth through um, uh, retirement, for example. Um, a, a simple concept like um, now in their productive age, um, which mostly like they are making like um, this amount of money, and when they retire, they will be making a lot less, but their expenses is actually uh, inversely uh, correlated. So I think it is very important to help them prepare to um, have a secure financial future. And I think that's, that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, Andrew, and Sigit for that. So, okay, so I'm going to just cut to the chase here, right? I think we have 60 investors here. All of them, they just read in the news, right? Impending recession, interest rate going up. So. I think what we wanted to hear from you is what's your perspective as operators, right? Are these, you know, worries warranted, right? Or are these just a broader media narrative that might not entirely apply in the Indonesian context, right? So we have, we have Andre, maybe let me start with you, right? I think logistic is a very good proxy for consumer activity. And a lot of things has changed over the past year, right? Starting with the COVID impulse lockdown, now the sentiment changes to surrounding fuel prices and whatnot. Like, what, what are you seeing on the ground and what changes have you made within the operation, if any? Okay, uh, great questions. So, uh, for us, we are, six, we are quite fortunate to be uh, present in Indonesia because, as you might aware, that Indonesia contributes about more than 30% of Southeast Asia economies. And logistics, well, it's quite high. It's contributed to 50% of Southeast Asia economies. Um, having an operation on ground and as a tech company, we have the ability to connecting the dots and study the data. Um, compared to the uh, like past one, two years ago, uh, where there's a volume drops, actually by uh, this year, the volume is uh, reviving, and we have the, uh, you know, the commodity price surge. We expect to have net positive for Indonesian trades. Um, I have three three indicators that I want to share with you guys. So you talk about inflation, right? Um, so the inf inflation, uh, we we understand that Indonesia inflation is about 4.35 percent, but compared to uh, probably Singapore, South Korea, and Philippines, which is 6%, and India, maybe 7%, we are still doing better. Um, and then in terms of the export-wise, uh, from January to, uh, to, to, to June or April, it's really aligned compared, uh, it's about 90 billion um, US dollars, which is grown 40% compared to last year. It's really aligned with our volumes, actually. And even I've invited some of you guys, my assisting investor, to visit my warehouses. You see that my warehouse is full, right? So it seems that the volume is actually coming back. And uh, we believe, even though there's a lot of uncertainty in the global, uh, the situation in Indonesia is still better. And in logistics as a primary sector, we are trying to be uh, mindful and always be resilient during the market conditions. I see. And has, has it has there been any? How how's your growth looking right? Like how's how's what's your customer thinking? Um, any any changes there or any adaptations they've made they've made so far? Well, customers always want to get a cheaper cost, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> that's the situations. In terms of how they change, they are uh, value the logistics service provider more compared to the before, mm. because of this freight issues of the space, of the, 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 the cost increase. So they need someone that's able to help them to really deliver the goods on time with the respectable uh, cost. So right now, the value proposition of the tech company, we are able to integrate and understand the network density to source where's the best uh, shipping operation methodology to do the shipment. Uh, that's really make a difference. Thank you, Andre. Maybe let, let, let me move to, to Andrew, right? So the used cars landscape has attracted some recent attention, right? Especially in, in other markets in the US and China, right? There's this so-called used cars price surge, right? Um, supply chain issue which affected it. 
how how is this? How's the situation in Indonesia? And 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 and, and, and what, what are you seeing on the ground? I guess there are a few concerns that that people would have. First, when they take a look at, uh, for example, competitors in the U.S., Carvana, or uh, you know, they see a lot of public valuations being slashed ninety percent, ninety five percent, seventy percent. I think we have to understand fundamentally that in the U.S. and in developed markets in the first place, a lot of the growth was actually funneled through uh, the inflation and the logistics uh, supply chain disruption. So prices of cars had, used cars had doubled, tripled along that uh, in the last year. But I think what we are seeing in Indonesia is something that's fundamentally different, right? We are seeing numbers that are growing. So, for example, we've only started the used car platform uh, in the second half of last year. And in less than a year, we're actually contribution margin positive, segment margin positive, and even this month, we are generating more than $100 million worth of sales. Wow. Uh, we're also anticipating to double that uh, within the next six to nine months. And I think it's important to say that a large part of this is because we have invested early in technologies and we are connecting a lot of these uh, different dots out there. Uh, but in terms of the growth, probably, you know, it, there's a much stronger correlation between GDP growth and new car sales versus the used cars because typically there is a countervailing sort of force with used cars, right? So if the economy is not doing as well, um, then essentially people might not want to buy as many new cars, but definitely there is a support from the used car sector. I think the last thing that we also want to think about is that, you know, when we take a look at consensus of the Indonesia GDP growth right now, it's still probably somewhere at 4%, 5% um, growth. I think the other thing is that as government debt over GDP is about 40% today, so there are some ways that the economy could potentially be, be stimulated. But that said, you know, even at, say, 10,000, 12,000 cars that we are trading today, um, that we, we buy and we sell out, essentially that's only about 4%, you know, 3% of the market. So even if the market shrinks by 5%, there's still a lot more space to grow into potentially, right? So I think generally speaking for the used car industry, that probably isn't a, a good reason to account for a lack of growth. I, I would say that if we don't grow successfully in the next one year, two, three, four years, it's our own delivery that's a problem. It's our own execution that's a problem and not the market. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so maybe let's, let me move to Sigit. Well, at creation and capital markets, which unfortunately has not been performing very well year to date, right? Um, in fact, I think in the, at least in the US, the stock, the stock market in general has underperformed used cars as an, as an, as an asset class. So how, 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 does it, how does it affect your business and, and, and how, how would you adapt to these changes? Um, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's interesting um, because I think historically speaking, um, when U.S. tightened, I think the rest of the world kind of suffered, right? And Indonesia, I think, has experienced some of that in the past as well. But um, particularly this year, yeah, I think um, if you look at the history also, U.S. market um, trades at about 60% premium on the PE basis to the rest of the world. And that um, premium becomes bigger during COVID. Um, we are seeing some um, sort of like um, normalizations and correction uh, from that premium. But I think Indonesia market, uh, equity market is actually, um, if we take out some of the Middle Eastern like, uh, countries in Asia, actually Indonesian market is the best performing equity market in Asia uh, year to date. So I think um, our business is... Uh, also correlated um, with how the capital market is performing, but as uh, I think one kind of like indicator, um, the net inflow that we are seeing uh, year to date is actually double compared to last year. So I think um, the, the Indonesian market is at the better positions uh, because of our commodity export um, this year around, but I think of course we have to see how the central bank will um, I think yesterday was like actually a very strong performance also in the in the in the market because I think central bank is trying to also start to increase rates. Um, I think the view is that the next meeting the, the central bank will start to increase, and 
I think it will also probably help with like uh, stabilizing the rupiah. Um, so I think in the way we see it, um, as long as we see this risk, I think uh, ahead of us. But I think um, given the macroeconomic uh, situations, and I think we are sort of like a better prepared uh, to this um, adjustments in the global economy compared to the uh, previous cycle. Yes. I see. I see. Th thanks for that. And and I think maybe 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 zooming back home, right? Talking about the tech startup scene in general, recent news about you know layoffs, retrenchment, and whatnot, which to some extent I believe is correlated with this whole cycle which you just mentioned. Um, any comments? Maybe maybe starting from Andre, right? On that, uh, is that is that something which you see will continue will continue to, to you know to, to occur, or is it like a one-off thing and 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 and, and, and done? Okay, um, talking about the resource, right? On uh, where, how the, the startup scene in um, you know doing a lot of layoff. Uh, most of the case is impacted by the industry sectors, I believe. Uh, to be fair, uh, in our case, where in logistics, the way that we see this is that as long as we have 270 million populations, right? So the domestic consumption is still there. And how we want to adjust to this environment is that uh, in terms of the numbers of expansions, how we want to do expansions, and we focus on assisting branches or profitable routes to, to keep the steady growth and uh, make make the, 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 the density and make the overall organizations uh, be sustainable in the futures. So we, we don't really actually have a massive layoff. We actually keep the, the people, but because of this competitiveness, it's actually giving us an opportunity to get rid of the, the fat and building our muscles. So back to your question, it really depends on the industries because our primary sectors in logistics, you, we're still moving goods and we hope this to, to continue for the next uh, couple of years. Got it. Uh, Andrew, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think from our perspective, there are a lot more products that our customers would require, um, both from a financial perspective and when I say customer, it's not just the end customer, including the dealers that work with us, the agents. And essentially, our tech team has doubled from January this year. Mm -hmm. And we're still aggressively hiring, actually. So instead of layoffs. But I think fundamentally, the, the, the question is, what sort of a business are, are, are one running? Um, essentially, we need to differentiate between what's positive at the sort of contribution margin perspective and what, what are tech costs. So we are starting to see quite a bit of operating leverage on, on the tech end, but we believe that for every dollar we spend invested in, in tech that builds specific products where we can see the margins that we'll be making, um, essentially those are all positive. So if you, the, I, I guess the point is whether you can track the productivity of the tech team. So we've managed to hire quite a few senior hires from uh, some of the previous tech companies as well. So these were people that, you know, might not have wanted to join us earlier on. So I think it's a good time to hire selectively good talent uh, mm. during this period as well. I see. And Sigit, any comments? Um, maybe I guess there is, um, people are acting more rational uh, mm. compared to last year. Right. Um, I think even when it comes to like the companies, I think the talents, um, people adjust their expectations. Um, I think which is good, uh, to be honest with you, because there were a lot of hype last year. For example, maybe in the past two years, like a good talent will shift jobs uh, four times, and then at every turn they will expect their salary to increase 50%. Uh, we start like uh, to see like this happening less and less, uh, because I think like Andrew said, uh, companies start to hire more selectively. Um, I think that's what we are seeing, but we are not seeing like a, a massive. Uh, layoffs. I think we are, Indonesia, I think we are quite far from recession, right? We are exper uh, expecting like a 5% GDP growth until the end of the year. So I think um, it's, 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 it's a growing uh, economy. But yeah, I think, I think that's how we observe at least. Okay. So we only have a couple more minutes left. Um, and perhaps maybe to fin finish this off, what message you want to say, you know, to these, pan to these you know, guests of, of you know, from esteem institutions, right? Um, do they need to, from investors' perspective, we are obviously 
very well aware of the impending macroeconomic condition. But what message would you want to give, you know, as, as operators, as one on the ground, to the investors? Um, maybe we can start with Andre if you want. Um, so the key takeaway from, from uh, what I've been learning so far is that in the time of uncertainty, there will always be an opportunity, right? And you guys in this room is a great people. You understand well about the macroeconomics, what's going on. Uh, so during this period of time, you might be selectively uh, uh, filtered the region where you want to deploy your capital and resource. But most importantly, I believe that Indonesia, we are still one of the good performance. And uh, you can work with the funds, you can uh, see directly to the portfolio company or to the sectors. But at the end of the day, it's your call, but I believe this is a great opportunity to invest in Indonesia. And you can work with East Venture for sure to deploy the money, right Wilson? <laughs> I guess from my perspective, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's clear, but uh, this is the first time I've ever on a panel, and there's only one person I'll do this for, right? Tons of, you know, a lot of other people have asked me, but I'm only doing this because of, of, of Wilson. Um, and one of the key reasons this is the case is that I, I think when investors think about value, right, you, you can't think of, you know, everyone wants to maximize what value is today. But I, I encourage you to have a longer term vision of, of what this value is, right? It's not just about getting the cheapest valuation today, squeezing the founders that you can at, you know, whether you get in at 5 million or 6, 10. You know, fundamentally, Southeast Asia is a early booming economy if you have a 10, 15, 20 year vision, right? So, you know, there was never a trillion dollar company in the US 10 years ago. Now there are a few. It's the same for Southeast Asia, right? So I think if you start working with a lot of the earlier stage investors and, and companies and actually have a much longer term plan, if you give them sort of fair valuations, have a fair approach in the way you work with them, then I feel like it's a much longer term journey. And in the longer term, even in the five years or 10 years, you will start to see a lot more value than that. I mean, I'm a fundamental sort of an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't come out from a, a tech, high multiple valuation sort of a perspective. So I think for us, it's about building that relationship. Um, with Wilson, you know, in the last four or five years, he's been supporting uh, my co-founder, Jovin. Time and again, almost went bankrupt, time and again, right? And each time, you know, within reason, Wilson was tough um, and the team, but always showed support and always being very fair. So it doesn't mean that you just have to give everything that the founder wants. But I think that in the last one year, you know, business has been really quite spectacular. But without the support from East Ventures for the last five days, for the last five years, I'm sorry, uh, we will never be where we are today. So, so really big thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, so we, we give financial advice to retail investors, but I... I assume everyone here is like a very qualified professional investors, so I'm not sure whether my advice will be applicable, but I think at least how we um, usually give advice to our uh, users, I think um, we like to remind them that equity market tend to overshoot in either direction, uh, either on the way up or on the way down. Um, but I think that creates opportunity. And um, if we look at, historically speaking, um, the way to invest, I think um, it's, it's, it's always the same. I think um, manage um, a well-diversified portfolio, um, focus on the long term, and I think um, really, really understand the company fundamentals that um, you are getting exposed to. Um, one question when we advise our users to pick a company, if, if, if when you buy a stock, then can you see like uh, the guy running the, the management running the company as your business partner? Uh, will you will you will you put your money and then can you sleep well at night? I think um, that's that's very important. So that I think that gives you the ability to um, invest in the long term. And I guess the the best time to invest, I guess, is during um, uh, when I guess like to be a contrarian, right? I think um, when everyone is thinking otherwise, I think that creates an opportunity. So I think that's, that's what I'm trying to uh, say, I guess. 
Thank you very much, um, Andre, Andrew, and Sigit. You will be joining us for the rest of the event. So for any of the investors, talk to them, meet with them. I, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for, for our esteemed panelists. Thank you again. Um, I think we have uh, a session, right? Okay. To you, Siska. Thank you very much to Pascal, our moderator. And once again, thank you speakers for that insightful discussion. Kita berikan tepuk tangan sekali lagi yang paling meriah. Again, a round of applause. And as a token of appreciation from East Venture Summit to the speakers, we have prepared a token of appreciation to each and every one of you, which is a live caricature drawn by artists. Actually, they've drawn you right as you were speaking at this discussion. They're still preparing the framing right now. It's, it's that kind of live drawing. We're going to present to you any moment now, but again, we hope that this token of appreciation can be a good commemoration of your time here as speakers at East Venture Summit 2022. Maybe we can start with a group photo session with the moderator and the speakers. We invite the photographers to first take a photo group session while we wait for the live caricature drawings. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the first panel discussion at East Venture Summit 2022. All right, right after the photo session, we like to ask Mr. Pascal Christian Sarana to present our token of appreciations to our speakers. There you go. Let's take a picture first. We hope you like it. A unique interpretation of you as one of the speakers right here at East Venture Summit 2022. The next live caricature drawn right here, right now in this room as you were discussing today's topic. Again, we like to show the talent of Balinese artists. And last but not least, our last live caricature. So later on this afternoon, we have a rapid pitching session. This is rapid drawing session for the speakers. Okay, maybe we can have one more group photo, yeah, holding the caricature drawing. There you have it, a warm and intimate moment right here at East Venture Summit 2022. Let's put our hands together one more time. 